The next phase in the hiring process is thinking about testing and what tests do we want to give? Why do we want to give them? And are they, is the information we're going to get from those tests justifiable and, and, and important with respect to whether or not we want to hire a particular candidate? So we've talked about sort of the background checks and the reference checks and things like that. Um, but there are additional tests that we may give someone and do we want this information and is it going to A, have an adverse impact or B, does it violate someone's privacy rights, right? I mean, so there's always this incredible fine line that we walk between what we need, what we believe that we need to ensure we have what we call a problem-free and a substance-free workplace, people who aren't engaging in drug abuse or alcoholism while they're on the job, those sorts of things, and comparing that to the, the people's privacy issues. And more and more, we're seeing those pri the, the limits of privacy are shrinking and shrinking. There are employers that will say that I want you to be alcohol free or I want you to be drug free or smoke free. And a great example was the Waco Corporation who basically said we're going to have a smoke free workplace. And I think we mentioned this in the chapter when we talked about um, employment at will. He was able to get away with what he did by sort of sort of shrinking the privacy rights of individuals by simply saying, I pay additional fees and higher insurance rates and there's more sick days and more time off, more breaks for people who are smoking. And smoking is not a protected right. It is not considered um, a, a right for individuals. It's a privilege if you want to work for a company and they choose to be smoke free or cigarette free or, you know, tobacco free, they have the right to do that because employment at will is employment at will. And if you're doing something I don't like, I can simply say you're fired because you're not engaging in the behaviors that I expect that you should be allowed, that, 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 that I want. And so, again, the privacy issue is, though, what if the person doesn't smoke on the job? What if they only smoke when they're home? And is that still okay? And, and the argument under employment at will is, it's not a protected situation. So employment at will will trump that. And employment at will will say, if you want to let somebody go for good cause or no cause, um, you can do that. As long, again, as long as it's not violating a public policy related issues and things like that, all those exceptions we talked about. Yeah, you can you can let somebody go. So that is a, the privacy rights are a big concern. We'll talk more about privacy as we get into Chapter 14. But I will tell you that, you know, where those limits are, 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 it varies from state to state. And, you know, we allow for some degree of privacy, but employers more and more are using employment at will to sort of squelch some of the, the free will that we have in terms of surfing the Internet or smoking cigarettes in our private time. or And we may see this pop up when it comes to marijuana use and things like that, where it's legal in some states, but we still see people who are not... Um, that are still being prosecuted for smoking marijuana. There are two basic types of employment, pre-employment testing. One is eligibility, whether or not someone has the knowledge, skills, and ability to do a particular job. Those are not in question. And if we can justify that the, that, that these tests are valid assessments of the skill set that we believe someone needs to do this job successfully, we can use eligibility tests. It's the ineligibility tests that become a little bit more problematic. For example, we want to make sure someone is free of drug use or cigarette smoking or that someone in, has integrity um, and, and maybe that they don't have any um, cheating or stealing in their background. So the ineligibility tests are we have to be really careful that the tests we're using, again, show that this is a real problem, that it has an impact on our business, and that um, we want to make sure that the ineligibility tests are protecting people's rights, but at the same time also protecting the organization's rights to have a drug-free, problem-free workplace. So it's, it's always this very fine line, you know, that, that you have to walk um, in terms of thinking about what the ineligibility tests um, um, are addressing. So some things for, that are, are examples of ineligibility tests are things like um, drug and alcohol testing or polygraphs or HIV testing. Someone's HIV status should not be relevant. Someone's genetic status should not be relevant to getting a job. And so the, you know, 
would we be using ineligibility tests saying, well, I don't want to hire somebody who might have a problem with breast cancer because that would make my insurance go up. So I'm not going to hire someone with that. That we cannot do. So that's an ineligibility test. And we're very limited in being able to use those. So eligibility tests, as we said, are things that are conducted to ensure that someone has the knowledge, skills, and ability to do a particular job. They have the capability and the qualifications needed to do that. It has to be legally validated, so we do um, validity tests to make sure that the test and the assessment that we're going to use is job related and is related to business necessity. Um, so that if we have this particular thing that we're screening for, then we want to make sure it's relevant to our particular job. Um, the way how do we do that? Well, we start with the job analysis process, which, as you, you should all know, that the job analysis process tells us what the nature of the work is. It tells us what the knowledge, skills and abilities are that are required to do this job. And then we create our testing, our assessment based on that job analysis results. So it's important for us to make sure we have a good job analysis and a job description that tells us what the requirements are and then we determine the tests that we use based on the results of that job analysis and job description. In order for us to use assessments to ensure that they are testing what we want them to test, which is job related or business, um, business, uh, business necessary characteristics, um, we need to have a valid selection tool. That valid selection tool, as you know from survey HR courses, uh, should be criterion related validation, content related validation, or construct validation. All three of those under the, um, uh, uh, Uniform Guidelines and Employee Selection Practices, the UGESP, states that we have to use valid tools, and those are the different ways that we can um, determine whether or not something is valid. Criterion related validity is looking at um, the association of your predictor variable with your um, your outcome variable, making sure that they're they are correlated or and appropriately related in a um, in a regression equation, content validation, whether or not the content of the test matches the content of your job requirement and construct validation gets at a, a larger net, the, the nomological net of things that would be included in a particular characteristic and making sure that we are the questions that we ask are assessing that. And we can get that when we use, you know, multi criteria um, questionnaire like your SAT or your ACT. You ask a bunch of questions related to verbal ability and, and those questions on verbal ability need to be related to the thing that you're assessing and you say that you're assessing, which is verbal ability. So you don't want to have a question on science when you're asking people about their, you know, what they should be knowing, which is, you know, their verbal ability, their, their ability to make analogies and to write sentences and to use grammar properly, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, we are obligated to use valid selection tools. Um, and, and if we don't use those, and that, that can come back and be an example of, of discrimination because we are using tools that we know are not predicting the outcomes the way we want them to be. They are not good at, 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 at assessing, you know, the outcome that we want, which is whether or not someone could perform the job. There are all sorts of different uh, types of tests that we are engaged in. We know that there are cognitive ability tests, physical ability tests, personality tests, all sorts of typing tests. Um, you know, um, there's just a wide range of different types of tests. And so integrity tests are actually a form of um, eligibility test, not a form of ineligibility. So an integrity test is looking at, does someone have integrity? And can we assess that? Um, personality test, do they have certain personality characteristics? And we know attention to detail or conscientiousness is a strong correlation to um, successful um, uh, performance on the job. And so it's a, it, it's legitimate for us to be able to say we, we want to test you for your conscientiousness to see whether or not you have a conscientious personality. And if so, then um, we would that would be um, a valid tool to use to determine whether or not someone could actually do a particular job. Psychological tests 
um, are used by 40% of Fortune 100 companies. So these psychological tests, while you may not, you know, the, the average applicant may not see the relationship between the test and their ability to do the job, we do know, right, that if someone is not conscientious, if someone is lazy, that these are the types of things that come out in these personality tests and these psychological tests and can have an impact on, on us if they cannot do the job well. Um, integrity tests are also trending where we want to make sure that someone is not going to be stealing from us and that they bring integrity to the workplace. Um, not all integrity tests are equal. Not all um, tests of whether or not someone is lying um, are equally useful. So it is important that you do your homework and you, when you are determining which selection tests to use, that you use a, a valid test, and then B, you use one that you know has, a, does, has done a very good job of predicting of the integrity of the people who are working there. Physical ability tests are really good as well. Usually those are determined through content uh, validity, and if, like, if the content of the physical ability test matches the type of physical expertise you need to demonstrate on the job, we can see how the content of the test matches the content of the requirement of the job, for the job description, in which case then, um, if you do well on the test, you should do well on the job. Medical tests, obviously, that's going to depend on the job, and certainly we don't do it as a screening mechanism. We we might ask someone, you know, if they pass all the other things that they, their job offer would be contingent on passing a medical test. So we, we want to be mindful of that. So now we need we turn to this con um the conversation to this idea of ineligibility testing. And if someone has a drug or alcohol problem, they are ineligible then to work for the company. So, you know, again, eligibility tests are about the KSAs. Ineligibility are about the characteristics in someone that we don't want to have that we're testing for. That's usually things regarding drug and alcohol abuse and stuff like that. Um, there are some restraints on when we can do drug and alcohol tests and we'll get into that a little bit more in chapter 14 it'll discuss in a few other chapters as well for different reasons but by and large our drug and alcohol tests um, have to be justified that there has to be a clear benefit to doing it that if, if someone is engaging in drug and alcohol tests you know use and abuse on the job we're much more likely to see workplace accidents or low productivity, injuries, turnover rates, and things like that. We know that this is an impact, but we also want to be mindful of the fact that certain types of jobs, um, it's not as important as um, it is on, on some sort of certainly manufacturing type jobs and things like that. So you're more likely to see it in an environment where people are doing more physical labor versus more um, um, uh, intellectual labor, right, and, and, or, or cognitive labor. Um, and so the balance, of course, is, you know, what does it cost us to do this and what is it going to what would it cost us if we didn't do this? We're constantly looking at that balance. We're also looking at privacy concerns, right? So if someone is doing marijuana on their private time at home, are they protected, you know, if they test positive for marijuana when they show up to work on Monday, right? Because if someone gets high on the weekend on a Saturday night, by Monday, that marijuana is no longer impairing them, but it still shows up in their blood work, right? So one of the challenges we have is getting the appropriate testing needed to address when someone is actually impaired versus when someone is not impaired uh, on certain types of things. And with more and more marijuana becoming legal, you know, where do the workplace requirements and workplace concerns um, uh, draw the line against, you know, privacy concerns, right? There's always this benefit and this trade-off that we're dealing with. But I think it is important to recognize that these tests can be expensive. And if you have, if you're testing every single employee you have every, every month or every couple of months, this can be a big cost. So could we screen people? Sure, we can screen them at first. And then we only do, um, uh, spot testing when it's needed or random testing when it's needed um, if we know that there's a continual problem or only if there's if there's just cause you know if we have cause to believe there was a workplace accident we have cause to believe that somebody may have been impaired we have an obligation to test them for that 
So if you're going to use ineligibility testing, you should be aware of what some successful employer plans incorporate. Number one, if you're going to have drug testing, um, that you want to have a written drug policy that's drafted with feedback from your employees to make sure that it's clear what your drug policy is. You want to make sure you've got supervisory training so that people who are supervisors know what to look for and that they're trained in how to appropriately handle a circumstance. You want to make sure that there's educational systems in place of, of what happens if they're engaged with alcohol or drug abuse on the job, what impact that has on their job, what impact that has on the safety of people around them and making them aware of that. You want to make sure that if someone's got a, an alcohol or drug problem, that they have access to an employee assistance program. Those employee assistance programs help them to overcome their alcohol and drug uh, addiction um, if that becomes the issue with the job. So we want to make sure that we provide them an opportunity to get better because alcohol and drug abuse can be considered a, um, a, a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act if they're actively engaging um, in it, it's a problem, but obviously we want to, if we've already invested on our employee to hire them, to bring them on board, to train them to do a job, you know, a weakness in them, meaning that they have this addiction, if we can help them overcome that addiction, then we can retain a good employee, right? Uh, and you should have a drug testing program that's set up appropriately with random uh, testing or, or um, testing for just cause. Um, and that protects people's privacy as well. So you always want to have that fine line. Um, and the and the key case here is National Treasury Employees Union versus Run Robin. You can read that in your textbook.